Hi, I'm Meredith Blackwell. This is Kathy Ayn. And I'm Don Feaster. And we are at the Mycological Society of America meeting in 2019 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we are going to interview my former colleague, much missed, Kathy Ayn. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kathy, tell us about your very early life. And also, I think, especially coming from my background, I'd like to hear about your heritage. Really? Um, cool. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., but my father, of course, is from New Orleans. He comes from a very old New Orleans family. Uh, last name Aim, uh, Valcor Aim was a very famous man in his time. And unfortunately, he gave all the land away. Yeah, so he Valuable established land. Jefferson, Jefferson College uh, along the Mississippi River. Yeah, Valcor Aim did, which was the first college, I believe, in, uh, in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've tried to trace any connection between our families, haven't we? But, yeah, uh, we not, haven't we haven't been successful yet, no. but we know it's there. <laughs> but um, growing up in D.C. in the D.C. area, we spent all of our summers in New Orleans, visiting family there. So it was always a, a second home for what us. What a time to go! <laughs> yeah, it was a good time to go. I remember, you know, my grandma's house. So I was really into insects and amphibians and things and she had all those we call them chameleons they're really the animals right. all over the backyard yeah the anoles so we used to chase those all the time see how many anoles we could catch i loved her house now i have a cat that lives in my backyard some of the time and catches anoles <laughs> see green tails hanging out <laughs> so Kathy's uh, a cat person yeah Tell, but I, I don't know, after uh, D.C. and growing up and this connection, where did you go to college? What's your undergraduate? Uh, I, went, uh, I went to college at Virginia Tech, um, started in 83, and uh, my grandmother, the one in New Orleans, my grandma I am, got sick. Uh, during my third year, so I, I went down to New Orleans to take care of her. And after she passed away, instead of going back to school, I actually uh, ended out playing in a bunch of punk bands in D.C. for about 10 years. The missing Great. 10 years. <laughs> the missing 10 years. Waitressing, uh, working in bookstores, just being a vagrant. Um, and in this business about the missing 10 years, eventually when you come to LSU, yeah. they hire you and do everything except they haven't got the FBI check that they do on everybody. <laughs> and it's taking them a long time. And the department chair calls me in one day in Plant Path, not my department, but he wants to know if I had any idea what was going on in the missing 10 years <laughs> and could that be holding up your appointment <laughs> but eventually they eventually they got, they got it yeah. Yeah. Cert certified so, 10 years so, <laughs> so after your loss, of your lost 10 years what happened <laughs> after my lost 10 years i turned 30 and i said it's time to get serious so i went back to virginia tech um I had start, been an entomology major, and uh, the last course I had to take to finish my degree, I needed a lab course, and I signed up for mycology, and I, the mushrooms, I don't know anything about them, but it sounds cool, and of course the great, great Orson Miller was my professor, and uh, he opened my eyes to a completely different world with so much left to discover. And he was just the best mentor. He was super encouraging and uh, sucked me right in. So did you go right away into graduate I school? I did at that point. Yeah. Immediately into grad school, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. And what did you do for your thesis? Uh, for my, <laughs> so one of my first meetings with Orson, I had no idea what grad school was. I was first person in my family with a college degree. Didn't even know about. You know, you're another one. 
Yeah. Uh, there are many mycologists. Yeah, many mycologists yeah, were the including first. Including me. Yeah. yeah. Well, my sister first. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, I was I was completely ignorant. So uh, when I went in to his office, one of our first meetings, I said, "Okay, I'm here for grad school. What should I do? What do I work on?" And he pulled this book. It was Hessler and Smith's 1965 monograph of Crepidotis. He pulled it off his shelf and he said, "Here, nobody's worked on this for a while." And that was it. So I worked on Crepidotis. You, you should have heard Ron Peterson. You will hear his interview, but yeah. that was the way he picked the project. You know, no one was working on yeah. it. No yeah. one was working on this. Yeah. Blame it fast. And, and people used to, in those days, put an ad or a, a little notice in Mycologia newsletter, Mycologia Society newsletter, saying they were claiming that group. Yeah. <laughs> funny, funny. Yeah, yeah or some this old school. And so you you did Crepidotis, I did Crepidotis. which is uh, I well describe it to me. I don't think <laughs> of it as a charismatic fungus, but you might. <laughs> you know, I devoted what five years of my life to it. It's still not very charismatic, but it's <laughs> it's very interesting as any fungus is when you look at it in detail. So tell what what what's was your approach to it? How did you work on it? And think yeah, about it? Um, the big question at those in those times, molecular biology was just starting to be applied to fungi, and we were starting to question species concepts at that time. And of course, all the crepidodi there were 250 species described in North America. They're all based, of course, on these minute little morphological uh, differences. And so what I decided to do eventually for my PhD was just, it sounds really passe now, but test all these different species concepts, the morphological, the molecular, uh, do mating. Um, so well, apply a biological, yeah. apply a biological species concept and then see what the, the best measure is. And um, of course we didn't have the facilities to do molecular work uh, at Virginia Tech. So that's when I started working with Rita Spilgelis down at Duke. And Ritas is my second really important mentor because he opened his lab to me. And I would drive down to Duke on the weekends and holidays and work in his lab. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, my, I couldn't finish my thesis without that, yeah. that capability, at least not to the degree I did. So, um, so did you go straight to the USDA lab then, to Beltsville, or? No, actually? so I did my, my postdoc uh, at Oxford University. I forgot about that. Yeah, with Lorna Castleton. So I wanted to try um, learning more about molecular genetics at that time. And Lorna's lab was working in um, mating genes, but real hardcore molecular mm -hmm. genetics uh, with Copernopsis, what is now Copernopsis. And so I worked on uh, characterizing the B loci, the MAT genes, the pheromone response, all of that in Lorna's lab for two years, which was a tremendous experience. Uh, and, really helped. Yeah, Maricel was. Maricel and I were were postdocs together. Yeah, yeah. lifelong friends. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I went to the USDA. Okay, and, and did you couldn't work on your mushrooms anymore, or could you? Well, I, I did on my own time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, worked on my mushrooms, but the, the USDA job was advertised for somebody to work on rust fungi, which was not at all in my wheelhouse, <laughs> but uh, I thought they were fascinating. You know, I remember at my defense, somebody asked me what I thought the coolest group of fungi were. Like the rust fungi, I don't even know where that came from, but they just have these really complex life cycles. Oh, wow, that was yeah. opening up a whole new world. Yeah, yeah. Who knew? yeah. led to lots of good things. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a group that nobody was working on much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, it, group. yeah, no, it, yeah. it, it <laughs> makes a difference, and yeah. and all of the work on rusts was kind of uh, retro. Uh, uh, in a way, you yeah. know that, uh, that there, you know, you had descriptions, you had assumptions about hosts and host relationships and host switching and so forth. So many hypotheses, no testing of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. 
but many hypotheses to test. Yes, exactly. But you really need yeah. molecular data. You characters. need a molecular data to yeah. do it. You think of how Arthur used to do this old school, you know, hand by hand inoculations yeah. to find an alternate host, thousands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, plants. they that's what they all that's did. That's what you, you know, had to they, do. These rust culture uh, experiments yes. every summer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember um, I never did find it, but uh, George Cummins, when he knew I was in Louisiana, was saying I ought to find an alternate host for something that grows on uh, two uh, the aquatic uh, tree. It grows in, in swamps. Uh, Sour gum? Tupelo? Tupelo. Tupelo yeah. gum, yeah. And is, do you know of one on Tupelo? No. Yeah, he said there was rust. I think it was Tupelo gum, but it probably had an alternate host and he didn't know it. Yeah. I should have known the technique <laughs> to try everything. To try, yeah. To, try yeah. to, yeah, infect the alternate host. Well, now we do that with DNA, right? Yeah. You can yeah. match up the Isha and the Uridinia spore if you're lucky enough to have them. But. Yeah. So then after working for a while at Beltsville USDA lab, I came to Kathy join you. came to be my colleague, <laughs> and that was so wonderful. Yeah. Because I had been there for years without a real colleague, and it was so much fun to teach my colleague with Kathy. Well, was, talk about teaching together. Yeah. We all attended all the classes. Yeah. We were both there. I should say both of us. So uh, once in a while, one of us missed, but usually we were both there and we divided up the lab, lectures and labs. And Kathy did uh, old night seats, kitchen. I did, yeah. The did. city old night seats. Uh, and you did, you did the ASCOs and the slime molds. Yeah, and something else. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the zygos. And the zygos, yeah, yes, of yeah. course. So it was really, really fun, and uh, it made teaching much easier. <laughs> and you did to labs? The you, you did, yeah, labs, did labs together? Yeah. yeah, we did the labs, uh, but we would each decide what was in yeah. the lab. And we've got all the stuff. I've got all the things I gave them to Hector, and I don't know how many people, but I've got all the lectures. They're a little dated now, but yeah. not too much. No, I mean, it's still good systematic taxonomy it's yeah. the basics you still need to learn yeah so. we even had review questions <laughs> gave yeah. in and had review questions yeah. so you left louisiana went to purdue yeah. and are you teaching a mycology course now i'm teaching microbiology uh -huh. i'm teaching microbiology now but i gotta say i love it i teach um so we already have an animal-centric micro course at Purdue. You know, your basic bacteria-heavy human disease. So what I teach is a plant-centric course. Um, so all the things microbes do in association with plants, the phyloplane, the endophytes, the rhizome. Uh, so, so what do you consider as a mi micro? Anything but animals and green plants, okay. basically. Okay. So you do have some fungi. In oh, there. it's but really fungal heavy. Okay. This course, yeah, it's very fungal heavy because mm -hmm. fungi have a lot of interactions with plants. Mm -hmm. Egg school yeah. majors, most egg school. Um, what kind of students? There, so it, it started out just for our department, which is mm -hmm. botany and plant pathology. But now I attract a lot of students. I bet from other uh, other departments, She's other a colleges. Student yeah. Student magnet. Yeah. Yeah. So you've graduated students. Three uh -huh. students from Purdue already? Three PhDs from yeah. Purdue, yeah. 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 Yeah, really good students. Yeah, really good students. In a very, very I diverse lab. Them. Yeah, very diverse lab. Yeah. yeah. So but talk about oh. No, I, I part of the diversity is this work that you're doing in South America and, and Africa. And how did that get all started? How did that get started? Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, going back to my childhood, we did a lot of camping and sort of exploration, cave exploring, creek exploring, uh, hiking in the Midwest or in the West. So when I was in graduate school, it was actually in Reedus's lab. Um, he had just hired a new student 
named Terry Hankel, uh -huh. and Terry uh, had been working on the botany of the Ghana Shield uh, through a Smithsonian program before he started up grad school. And he wanted to do his PhD studies in Guyana because he was very familiar with that system and the botany of it. And Terry and I got to talking and I was all for it. Yeah, let's go on big jungle adventures. And Terry uh, needed someone to help him identify fungi because he hadn't been in mycology. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'm a mushroom person. I can identify the fungi for you. And he promised me that there was crepidotus everywhere because I was working on Crepidotus. I said, all right, I'm there. So went out the very first year, and that is a story in and of itself because we went to a new area nobody had ever explored before, um, so logistically, and then trying to find uh, a place to start building our permanent site. Anyway, long story short, it was going to be one year. It's turned into, I think, 21 years for me now yep. of going out to this same area. Um, I had no idea what the fungi were when I was confronted with them because, because they, many they, of them weren't described. <laughs> they weren't known. So, so, so was that the, so very, I, the descending forest? Yeah, those yeah. were the descending okay. forests. Where there are very few yeah. big trees. Species. Yeah. So I, I, I was at sea that first year with most of those fungi, and there was no crepidotus. We never found any oh. crepidotus. <laughs> out there. You didn't know what it was. Are you lying? So, uh, so then I was actually on a grants panel, I won't say what, but you had a follow-up area of where you were gonna work. And it was actually the high, it was the best thought of proposal in the whole panel. Oh. Yeah, and so Gosh. it was sure to be funded. <laughs> and it was. Oh, thank and you. so then you started working in, in Africa. In Cameroon, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we picked the job for us because it really, was a good mimic of the ecological mm -hmm. conditions. And by the geographical yeah. 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 yeah, and so uh, we've been working there for four years now, mm -hmm. yeah, doing the exact same thing. And um, I think we interviewed two of your students last year, one from Suriname or... Uh, from Guyana, from Delon? Guy okay, Delon yeah. is from, okay, and one from Cameroon. Yeah, and that would be Blaise, yeah. yeah. So these are both students who a lot of my students are students that, whenever you, you do work in another country, I like to bring in the students yeah. from the local universities, right? Uh, so both of those were students we hired to work in the field with us, mm -hmm. and then we're able to, uh, to get them both yeah. enrolled no, in that's Purdue. great. I, yeah. It's building infrastructure yeah. in the country. Exactly. Yeah. There is no mycologist in Guyana, and they have a wilt. So Delon's fervent dream is to go yeah. back and start that program yeah. there. Yeah. And the same with Blaise yeah. and, and, and my others. Jorge uh, in Peru yeah. is uh, now establishing the first real strong mycology. And I yeah. want to go visit him. Yeah, well, you need to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So uh, also... Uh, I was trying to think when uh, when you were at LSU, the, the year you came, I think, they tried to recruit you to Purdue. I thought it was or right about the same time you came. No. Or you had just taken the job. Yeah, there was an earlier time. And then later Did they, they recruited. Yeah, that. they talked to you about it, I think, because okay. of the Russ collection. Yeah. yeah. So why don't you talk a little <laughs> bit about that? And this is how <laughs> Russ Fungi made your career there. Yeah, well, I started it. I don't even remember the first instance. I thought, Isn't I thought that they terrible? Had talked to you. Right well, they at may the have. Time. They may have. Done. And you said, "Oh, I've just come to LSU." They did. Mm -hmm. You're right. I forgot all about that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So then, um, several years later, Peter Peter Goldsboro, the uh, then the department head at Purdue, called me up again, and said. Uh, you know, or the same thing, ready? basically, are you, are you ready? ready? We want you to come to Purdue. And what he had done in the meantime was take the collections, the Arthur collection, and had gotten it insured and built a whole new facility for it. Um, so they had invested all this money in preservation of the collections. They just needed somebody yeah. there. And I... And they had had a, had a hard time finding the right person. Yeah. yeah. You, so you talk lucky. about the collection and Arthur a little bit. Yeah. yeah. You're there immersed in all of this. That's part of history. It is part of history. J.C. Arthur, we tend to forget, but he was an 
extremely important figure in early science development in the U.S. I mean, he was a founding member of the, the Botanical Society, the uh, Phytopath Society, and MSA, as was his student, George Cummings. Mm -hmm. um, he was the first person who ever got a PhD from Cornell. I have a so copy is it a that. PhD? Yes. Oh, well. I thought it was a doctor of science. Oh, that it has you a may name. be right. I need to look is at it that very diploma. Different? Well, I think it was in that era when PhD programs weren't right. uh, happening in the U.S. Okay. and uh, they had different names. But I think but it's yeah, they, he was the first, equivalent? I think, yeah. of the doctor of science. Was it work equivalent? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. 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 He was, uh, you know, he was a musician. I didn't know that. I found uh, on eBay, and I bought it for the herbarium, there is a piece of sheet music, uh, Viva Purdue, written by J.C. Arthur. Oh, wow. <laughs> is it used today? I, I haven't heard it used, but I've still You'll got have to get it introduced it. Yeah. yeah, play it out. Yeah. This football season. Yeah, it is football Introduce season. The football yeah, get Viva Purdue to, back um, out there yeah. 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 to Arthur. So did he spend his whole career there? Purdue? No, not his whole career at Purdue. But when he was at Purdue, he was the first um, department head of my department, still my department now, botany and plant pathology. Mm -hmm. um, it's a funny story about his collection. So he was a well-rounded plant pathologist. He also worked on bacterial diseases of plants, but rusts were his passion. And he built up this collection of rust fungi um, and he used his own money to buy the cabinets to do mm -hmm. the collecting and everything. Did he have family money or? You know, honestly, I don't know where that money came from, but I do know that he expended his own funds to, to build the collections mm -hmm. up. And so when he retired, he took the collections with him. Uh. And um, Purdue was upset. <laughs> and uh, we have all that old correspondence of digitized and conserved it now. But um, they haggled back and forth and Purdue ended up paying him a penny a specimen to repatriate him and yeah. uh, to Purdue with the stipulation that it would maintain a collection. It's, it's interesting, that, you know, that kind of phenomenon of a personal collection yeah. being built and so forth. The, the same kind of thing happened with Farlow and some of Did his it? collections that he uh, claimed them as, as his own. And he, again, had paid for all of it. Yeah. He had done all of it. He purchased some of the collections that we have now. But uh, the Cor Harvard Corporation changed their rules around Farlow about if you're doing this and accumulating things and you're paid by Harvard, they belong, they to, belong Harvard. to Harvard. They belong to Harvard. And I, I think there have been recent court cases where that's been upheld. That yeah. They go to the university. Yeah. Yeah. But we, d we don't think about that so much anymore. The, Where would you know, we the, put them? <laughs> well, the personal side, you know, the personal yeah. accumulation. Yeah. 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 And that being the resource that you, you spent your career building, but who does it belong to? Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting mm -hmm. question. I it think. is. It yeah. actually But is. I didn't realize that, that they yeah. had to buy it back. Yeah. It back mm -hmm. Do you know how many pennies? No, I don't know how many pennies. Good question. Ah. <laughs> you can look it up when you get yeah. home. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that. interesting. <laughs> yeah. And so um, you travel a lot. I do. And not just to uh, Guyana or to uh, Africa, mm -hmm. but uh, other places as well. Any chance you get, you go and collect rust. rust I do, I do. Uh, any any excuse is a good excuse. Uh, <laughs> rust fungi, I don't want to get into all the details, but uh, applying molecular biology to the rust has been problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, they're obligates, so you can't grow them in pure culture, so you're never going to get pure DNA um, from a rust extract. And then we have this problem we still don't understand the root of it, but older barium specimens are just worthless for DNA. You can get little, little tiny pieces out, mm -hmm. but nothing that's really useful for phylogenetics or barcoding. 
So, and there's been a real uh, temperate bias, as with most of my mycology, but a real temperate bias in rust fungi studies as well. So I do travel a lot in tropical regions to try to build up our collections, but also our, our molecular databases for these things and, and where these things are spread. Most of our emergent rust diseases are coming out of the tropics and they're rust that we didn't know about before until they, they hit a different crop. Yeah. Yeah, I remember a few years ago, was it daylily rust yeah. that nobody here yeah. knew about that came from Mexico? Yep, yeah, just yeah. came out of Mexico. Yeah. Right now we have Puccinia sidii, uh, which is threatening the ecosystems in, in New Zealand right now, in Australia and Hawaii. Um, came out of nowhere, out of the tropics. Mm -hmm. I think Brazil, maybe, but that's not even... So you were working, too, out in the middle of the Pacific? Yeah. So what gets out there? Does it come with the plants or, or are they native? You or? know, it's it's cool. So I also work on yeast that are related mm -hmm. to rust, and those seem to be really endemic. Um, all the yeast. Yeah, they don't blow around. Yeah, as much. they don't blow around as much. So tons of endemic yeast on some of these South Pacific islands. The rust um, are better travelers. Definitely. So we see some really, what I would call, common emergent pathogens yeah. there right now. We should wait a yeah. second. Yeah. These rusts, uh, these uh, leaf yeasts and so forth, so you're finding a lot. Yeah. Are you describing them all? All? No. <laughs> <laughs> as many as we can. Yeasts uh, take a while to describe. Oh, yeah. Uh, doing the, the physiology work, tests. If you do it yeah. Right. But yeah. uh, we've described quite a few. I mean, one's a, we, from Louisiana. We described a new order from Louisiana. Um, it was um, it's Sebastian. Remember, Sebastian isolated it from a um, aquatic fern, and it's a purple yeast. It's a beautiful purple yeast. So we have a purple swamp yeast. Uh, we called it Violacea mycetales. Um, and then there was the lovely Meredith Blackwellia, which yes. is a new genus of yeast from, from Guyana. I hope it remains. So fern, <laughs> fern leaf, yeah. Yeah, so we have described a, as many as we can. We, we're hoping to do like a big set of 50 right now. Now, are you still working in Africa? Is there any problem with... Uh, war and outbreaks? Yeah, well, Cameron. So yeah, that. no, that's why... Yeah, so that grant, we were supposed to work in the, the core up and mm -hmm. the jaw, and we've never been able to get to the core up because not even just us, but the, our, our local counterparts won't go mm -hmm. there. So it's just too dangerous. Yeah, but I did, uh, I just got back from Ethiopia where I was doing some work with the coffee rust there, um, which was stunning. Well, yeah, that's a shame because we need you know, Africa's usually a blank. Yeah. You know, I know. In all the distribution maps. It is. It really is. And, and we've, we've got to train more Local. African mycologists. We yeah. do. No, you're doing your part. You are. You are. From all parts yeah. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Got the aim. Yeah. The, the aim. Knowledge will go out. So that's great. Well, the, yeah. They'll go out. They'll, good. they'll do good. So, is there anything, uh, if you were, you probably tell your students all the time things about being a mycologist and uh, so forth. What would you tell people of the future? We're doing these videos. We're thinking about the history. What, what, what's the <laughs> forecast? What, what are you going to tell people? I, I'm going to avoid politics. Let's do that. <laughs> the fungal forecast. Yeah, fungal forecast. Where are we going? Oh, Don, I have no idea. Wow, well, I'm not what, a curious. You, know. you encourage him to be a mycologist. Yes. Absolutely. If that's, yes. Be a mycologist. There is more left to discover in mycology. Go where heavens. it takes you. Yes, go where it takes you. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about your career.
career is this going to look good? I think yeah. you have to really um, want to do it. You yeah, have to want to do it. Heart. And um, I, it's a hard sell to tell people not to worry about their career. No, it is. But you've had like Jason. Jason didn't worry about his career. What my my You're Jason? Jason. <laughs> Well, Jason is a now 45-year-old student who finished a master's and is going off to work with Andy Miller. Oh, good. And uh, he was a practicing artist. He was a sculptor. He then uh, did fine woodworking, building frames. Uh, and uh, he now is going off to do a PhD. And, but, uh, you know, it's following your heart and following your uh, yeah. sense of of uh, adventure, and yeah. I kind of look at all of this, what we do. Your, yours is more adventure than mine ever was, but it's, you know, it's the adventure with the group and with the geography and with the field work and, and looking for ways to uh, expand all of this. It's not my interview, it's yours. But <laughs> 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 so anything else to say? Nothing yeah. else except, uh, what can I say? I'm sitting here with two of the, the foundational mycologists oh, come ever. On. <laughs> We're not blabbing. <laughs> We're not that old. Yeah. Uh, anyway. But, Good. Well, well, we've enjoyed talking. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you.